indication. At the very heart of the so-called peace process in Palestine, since it began earnestly after 1967, uh, and it even produced, as you know, some Nobel Peace Prize as well. I mean, it was really regarded as one of uh, uh, the most enlightened part of Western civilization, the, the effort to build peace in Palestine on the basis of partition. At the heart of this process is the, the idea of the partition. It first was offered by the Zionist movement to Britain, when Britain was still a mandatory power, in 1937. As you know, uh, British policy between 1918 to 1937 was based on the assumption that both the settlers and the natives would be happy to bask under the imperial sun forever. Uh, which is kind of a notion Britain had about many other uh, people around the world, until they found out that, surprisingly, although everybody loved British theatre and literature and so on, they wanted independent from, from Britain, even the Indians. <laughs> so, when the realization came that uh, Britain would not be able to hold Palestine forever, and the Palestinians had revolted against the British uh, rule in Palestine and its pro-Zionist policy in between 1936 to 1939. Uh, the government in London was looking desperately for a way out of it. And they didn't have their own ideas, one should say. Uh, the Zionist movement was always very clever. And settler colonialist movements are very clever. They have to be very clever because they need to convince everyone that something that never belonged to them is theirs. So they have to be alert all the time. They need to have a ready-made history, a ready-made claim. The native people will never, are never able to confront it properly because they don't know how to answer the question, what are we doing here? But the Zionists always knew the answer to the question, what are we doing here? So they were also always very alert to the problems in Britain in formulating an idea for a solution. So in 37, given the fact that the Jewish community in Palestine, of, especially the settler community of Palestine, was only one third of the population, they suggested to Britain that the best idea for a solution is to partition Palestine. And they were even presented themselves as a modest group of people. They said, we, we just want one third of the country. Uh, because we are one-third of the population. Uh, and they also suggested that the rest of Palestine would actually be annexed to the new kingdom that the British have founded in Jordan. And uh, they found a way of inserting their ideas into a British inquiry commission, the Peel Commission, that suggested the partitioning uh, uh, of Palestine. The same idea with a different kind of division of the geography came in 1947. Again, this time it was not Britain, it was the United Nations, a very young international organization with no idea whatsoever how to solve international conflict. They haven't improved since then, one should say. <laughs> but at least one can forgive them their uh, problems in the first three years, uh, the teasing problem that they had. And Palestine was the real problem that they had to face. They had no idea how to solve the, the issue of Palestine. They sent a delegation under the name of UNSCOP, the United mm -hmm. Nations Special Committee of Palestine, of people who have never been not only to Palestine, have never been to the Middle East. And uh, they came uh, and, and they were lost for ideas. Uh, the Palestinians and the Arab states, anyway, boycotted the United Nations uh, Committee. So the only people they were negotiating with were the, the leaders of the Zionist movement. And not surprisingly, the Zionist movement said to them, we have a brilliant idea for a solution. We should partition Palestine. It was very interesting that the Zionist movement in 1947 felt so secure that it actually suggested that 80% of Palestine should be a Jewish state. The people who came from uh, Honduras and uh, Canada and Australia uh, felt 
you know, from kind of a Western logical perspective, that even even they understood that this was a bit too much, and they they went with the idea of parity. They said 50-50, more or less, is is a reasonable idea. What is interesting is what happened to us in the international community since 1947. We regarded the idea of partition as a very fair, just solution. And the moment the Palestinians rejected the partition, they were immediately framed as unreasonable, primitive people who are an obstacle for the uh, advance of uh, modernization and civilization in Palestine. This was a clever ploy of the Zionist movement, I must say. You really have to give it to them. They, 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 They come to someone's homeland with this fabricated idea that they used to live there 2,000 years before. And because of that, they, they have a right, at least to half of the place. And anyone who rejects it is the irrational person, is the primitive person. Whereas, actually, the hallucination is this idea that I can knock on someone's door in Bristol and say, excuse me, I used to live here 2,000 years ago. Please give me two of your rooms. <laughs> And the next day I come with a local policeman, and the local policeman says to him, you know, uh, here he is, he has the Bible, he's right. Bristol was his 2,000 years ago. Why, why are you not giving you half of the building? That this at all played a, a logical role um, among uh, policy makers is, is, is fascinating, but tragic at the same time. And... Um, this was something that uh, was built into the peace process later on. That if you do not agree to a partition, then you don't understand the essence of the conflict and you are not working for peace in Palestine. Because what partition did as an idea, it claimed almost immediately that you have two national movements with equal right to the place. Not a settler colonial project that is trying to get rid of the natives and definitely after three three generations of settlers has to reconcile with the natives and find, like in South Africa, a way of living together. That was not at all the direction of the of the peace process. The direction of the peace process was the just solution of partition. As if native people in the right mind would agree that the best way forward is to give up 50 or 60 or 70 percent of their homeland for the sake of peace. It is not surprising that certain Palestinian leaders and diplomats and so on eventually internalized this discourse. You only have to read Franz Fanon to understand that colonized people unfortunately do this. After a long time of colonization, you begin to internalize the logic, the perception, and the language of the colonizer. And you start talking about partition as if this is what the Palestinian National Movement was all about. And you start to regard it as the absolute project of liberation. Of course, history has a way of coming back to you when you do mistakes, you make mistakes like this. And the reality in Palestine today is a, is a painful uh, reminder of what happens if you internalize the colonialists' uh, perception. Uh, if you read Albert Mami, a wonderful book called The Colonizer and the Colonized. It was written many years ago, but you would think that this is someone who just visiting Palestine today and reports to you the PA's behavior, the Hamas behavior, the behavior of the Palestinian leaders inside Israel, you you won't believe that this book was written more than 45 years ago. Because Albert Mami understood very much the dynamics between colonizers and colonized. It's not black and white. It's not simple. There is a certain way in which the colonizer forces you to seek survival by being very harsh and very cruel, that genuinely you cannot blame the colonized when survival becomes more important than a solution. And that's what Israel is banking on. 
that the more the destruction would, the more it deepens the destruction, the more the Palestinian would internalize the Zionist logic that Palestinian presence in Palestine is a concession the Zionist movement is willing to give to the native people. And Israel will define which percentage of the, on which percentage of the land they can live and how can they live on that percentage. That this is a colonizer's dream or vision is not surprising. What is surprising is that the international community framed this Zionist vision as a peace plan. And some of the most intelligent people in the world, some of the best politicians that the West and Europe has to offer, are talking with this logic as if this is the only way forward. They would brush aside anyone who would talk about decolonization, a one-state solution, equal rights to everyone, as best as a hallucinator, as worst as someone who wants to destroy the state of Israel. Even some of the best friends of the Palestinians, like Norman Finkelstein and Noam Chomsky, have internalized this logic in a way which is very surprising for people who are so sensitive, so bright, such intellectual towers. It shows you how successful this project of misframing, as I call it, has been. And I'm not talking about the Palestinians, again, who, who internalize this, this as well. Now let me finish by saying that uh, I'm not a naive person. I understand that uh, deprogramming or deconstructing this language is, is a huge, uh, almost impossible mission. But that doesn't mean that we have any other alternative. We, we, we really don't. And uh, I think that there is a movement. There is a movement. There is a change in this direction. And it's very encouraging on the one hand, and it's also very precarious on the other. Maybe it's natural that the political elites, wherever they are, whether it's the United States, whether it's in Russia or China or Europe or in the Middle East itself, maybe it's not surprising that the political elites themselves will never come up with a new idea. The power of inertia uh, is, is the DNA of a politician. It's, it's, uh, it's to keep you in the place you are. Rattling the boat uh, can lead you uh, into big trouble as Mr. Corbyn has learned in the last few weeks, among others. You can't really rattle the boat as a, as a political leader from above. It's, it's, it's impossible, unless, unless there is such a catastrophe that people you know, are willing to, to build something new from the ruins. But basically, if the catastrophe is not felt by everyone and is not realized by everyone, it's very difficult by words to present fundamental alternative to the policies that are in place. There isn't one example in history where it happened without a dramatic revolution. Now, so it's not coming from the politicians. So the movement is not there. Namely, if you go with me on a trip and we'll talk to every foreign minister in the world, including those who are regarded as Palestine's best friends in Pretoria, uh, Caracas in Venezuela, I don't know, whoever, they will uh, politely say to you, uh, it's very interesting that you have new ideas, but we should stick to the two-state solution. The PA is for the two-state solution, the Hamas is for the two-state solution. Um, you know, it's, it's around the corner, so why, why try something new? You can tell them that you think that the corner that they're talking about is not on earth, but that won't, never would convince a politician to look elsewhere. So it's not coming from the political elite, but it comes from two very important groups. One is the political activists, who long before anyone else, I think, understood that uh, their own politicians, their own media, and their own academics 
were not framing in the right way the reality in Palestine. And it began by students, for instance, in universities who decided to uh, organize in a focused way the struggle for Palestine within the Israeli Apartheid Week. Now, when you call Israel an apartheid state, it doesn't mean you did the proper scholarly research to find out whether really the two systems are the same. Uh, it doesn't even mean that you are happy with post-apartheid South Africa. It means, more importantly than anything else, that you are looking at the Zionist movement as a settler colonial movement that is using means which are very common among settler colonial movements. If they don't genocide people, they segregate them, they dispossess them, they ethnically cleanse them. There isn't one settler community who said to the natives, let's build a democracy together. There isn't such a case study. What can you do? There isn't. Zionism included. So when you call it the Israel Apartheid Week, it means that you have a very different perspective on what the conflict is all about and what is the way forward. And if you adopt the same tactics used by the Solidarity Movement with the ANC against the State of Israel, the BDS, the boycott, the investment, sanctions. It means, again, that not only that you found something that you think can be very useful and effective, in fact, it's not yet effective at all. As you know, the BDS has not changed a bit any reality on the ground. The occupation is worse every day. The colonization is worse. The BDS did not succeed in, in changing the reality. But that's not what is important about the BDS. What is important about the BDS is, again, it conveys the message that the activists are not analyzing the reality in Palestine in the past, in the present, and in the future the same way as the political elites do, the same way as the diplomats do, the same way as the mainstream media does. And that's what's so important about talking about boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Of course, hopefully, it will be also effective. We have to give it time. It's, it's a young movement, and we may see the results on the ground. We don't for the time being. But it may work. It may work. Uh, but it, it, for the time being, it's important because it's, it's a new language. It really is a new language. Not surprisingly, the Palestinian Authority, until very recently, was very much against the BDS. Because they understood that this is a different language, which really undermines the whole idea of Oslo and partition. Because the BDS includes all the Palestinians, all over Palestine, as a group of people that deserves the solidarity and sympathy and activism of people around the world. The second group that is moving, which is very exciting, I think, and again, it doesn't have yet any impact on the ground, but we hope it will be, are the academics, which is quite surprisingly. <coughs> Talking as an academic, I can tell you that uh, academics and change or courage is, is a rare combination. Uh, but in the case of Palestine, they have, in the last few years, adopted the settler colonial paradigm for Palestine, insisting, not all of them, of course, but quite a few and important academics, insisted to rewrite the history of Palestine, to rewrite the political analysis of the reality in Palestine uh, from the settler colonialist uh, uh, perspective. And it's not surprising when we organize a, a conference on settler colonialism at the University of Exeter, uh, the uh, pro-Israeli uh, forces in this country did all they could to uh, try and stop a very marginal, small conference we had in Exeter. They, they, they understood fully and rightly, from their perspective, what is the significance on a conference that is academic, purely academic, sanctioned by the university, and is willing to apply the paradigm of settler colonialism to Israel. The Board of Deputies described it as something which is akin to uh, a meeting of Nazis. Uh, another Jewish group said that this is anti-Semitism of the worst kind. They don't know what settler colonialism is, by the way, but they heard the word colonialism, 
and that trigger in their mind something which I think they always knew, especially the Anglo-Jewish community, always knew that their unconditional support for Israel is a conditional support for a human project that anywhere else in the world would never receive their support. They would never support the apartheid in South Africa. They would never support oppression in Argentina and Chile. They would never support genociding people elsewhere in the world. And yet, when it comes to Israel, they forget all these very important moral precepts that uh, direct their uh, point of view. So when academia says, professionally, we are dealing with this, this is, is this mine? Oh my God. I think yes. Oh my you God. <laughs> Turn it off. Do you have I've, I've, two, you? I've, <laughs> okay. Turn it off? Yeah, yeah, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, this is something that uh, is, you can understand the fear from such a turn in the language, in the, in the, uh, the framing, if you want. The conference, by the way, eventually took place. Uh, and I think this will eventually lead, and this is where I started, and this is where I will end, <laughs> This will lead to the inclusion of the um, Palestine as a case study in courses on colonialism, in textbooks on colonialism, maybe in encyclopedias on colonialism, or in col the entry on colonialism, and so on. Uh, and maybe this kind of joint effort from below, by academics, by activists, would begin to change the way the reality is framed, from here at least. Again, this cannot by itself, of course, change the reality on the ground. Palestinian unity, American policy, uh, struggle from within the progressive Jewish community inside Israel are all very important. But I think that they, are all, they need a cement, they need something to, to keep them together. And that kind of cement is in the power of the of the, the pen, not the power of the sword. As the famous adage says, sometimes the pen is mightier uh, than the sword. And I think that uh, we should uh, do our best where we can change, uh, because there are some areas that we are unable to change things. So I think I'll stop here, uh, see whether it's an urgent call, and then uh, <laughs> answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.